Good morning, church. It is a pleasure to bring the Word of God to you this morning. I've been thinking about our passage, Matthew 23, and this passage, a few things came to mind as I'm thinking about them, some phrases that maybe you know well, phrases like, easier said than done, right? You might have heard that phrase before. Or, do as I say, not as I do. Or you might have heard the other phrase, put your money where your mouth is. These three phase, phrases have kind of a theme to them. This theme is speaking, saying something, and then a connection to doing something. A connection from not just saying, but doing. And there shouldn't be a large disconnect between the two. Those two things of what we say and what we do should be well connected, should be in line with one another. But that is not always the case, is it? We don't always do what we say. We don't always follow through. It's also interesting that we can appear one way. We can do the same disconnect without even talking, right? So we can try to act a certain way that would appear that we are something that we're not. We can put on an appearance. It's the same thing. Our action becomes a lie. Now, why is this so hard for us? Why, as humans, are we tempted to this such a thing? Tempted to appear one way that is frankly just not true about us. Why are we tempted towards that? I think it's because we start to value our outward appearance. We start to want people to like us. But what we're really doing is having them like what we're having them see, not actually us. We're putting on a facade for them to like. Either way, this topic of connecting your speech to your action and that disconnect is called hypocrisy. Easier said than done. And Jesus here is addressing this disconnect. Jesus here is calling his disciples and the crowds to not follow the way of the Pharisees. And he, in this chapter, we see a declaration of woes against the Pharisees who are living this life of hypocrisy. We see a promise to the humble, we'll see in the first 12 verses. In the rest of the chapter, we'll see a pronouncement to the hypocrite. So we'll see three warnings here for the disciples, and we'll see seven woes to the scribes and Pharisees. We'll see 10 points here in this message this morning, if you're ready. In this context, Jesus is speaking to the crowds and the disciples. And he says, verse 2, chapter 23, the scribes and Pharisees sit on the seat of Moses. So practice and observe whatever they tell you. Sitting on the seat of Moses would be that they're representing the legal Mosaic law. They're the ones you can go to. They're the ones who have authority. And Jesus is saying, do what they say. For potentially, what they're saying could have truth in it. It could be truth. But look what he says next. But, but not what they do. Do what they say, not what they do. For they preach, but do not practice. In a sense, we get this little personality of Jesus here. It almost seems like a sarcasm. Well, do what they say, but don't do what they do as though you have these leaders that are hypocritical and Jesus is still saying, do what they say. And this is our context for three warnings that Jesus gives his disciples in these first 12 verses. A context of, of who's in authority, a context of who can you follow, who can you practice when Jesus is standing there as the one who actually has the authority to sit in the seat of Moses, who actually has the authority for you to look at Jesus' life and say, I can live that way because he's practicing it. So verse 4, verse 4 is our first warning. It says this, They, that's the scribes and Pharisees, tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. I don't know how much weight you can pick up with just your finger, but they're not even willing to help a little bit with these burdens that they are putting on others. They want others to go through performance. They want others to go through a legalistic system. 
Jesus is warning his disciples against this legalistic performance nature of the Pharisees. It's not about following rules, Jesus is saying. It's not about putting heavy weight on people. For the burden of Jesus, what does he say it's like? It's light. His burden is light versus the burden of the Pharisees. This doesn't speak to how hard things are, but the lightness of the burden. So warning number one, legalistic performance. Warning number two we see in three in verses seven, or sorry, five through seven, says this. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. For they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seat in the synagogue, and greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called rabbi from others. These are the the last two of the three warnings Jesus gives. Here we see a warning of not valuing what we are actually living, but wanting to display a pious or an appearance of piety, to value your outward appearance versus what God is doing inside of you. They're seeking recognition. It's like if you won a competition and you got a blue ribbon and you wore it all week long. Or it'd be like if Tom Brady wore his four Super Bowl rings while he's helping his neighbor dig a fence post. And you can see all his rings every time he goes like this, you know, shining in the light. Or it'd be like Michael Phelps walking in the grocery store with his 22 Olympic medals that he has. I don't know how big that would be. 22 Olympic medals. If he's just walking around the grocery store, he's showing off. He wants you to see something about his appearance. In the same way, these Pharisees aren't concerned at all about what, what's going on inside of them. They just want others to see them. So they make their fringes long. They make their appearance look like they have piety. And it seems here this is a warning that the gospel, the reign of Christ in our life, should change our desire from wanting to be seen to wanting to serve. The desire from wanting to be great to want to follow the one who is great. And I think this is a temptation for us to be seen by others. And so Jesus warns his disciples and he warns us this morning. Warning number three, we we already read it in verse seven and eight, this idea they want to be called masters. They want to have their titles. They love their titles. One author says, true greatness pertains to service, not to titles. I had an opportunity of being an intern here at the church for uh, a season and then a longer season, so I was an intern for a little while, and then I got to be a director of children's ministry and a couple other things, kind of a jack-of-all-trades for a little while, and I was doing kind of director ministry, and I wasn't an intern anymore for a couple years, and then someone says, oh, how's your internship going? And I haven't been an intern for years. The temptation inside of me is like, I'm a director. (laughs) My title, I don't know how much different that is, really, but (laughs) I'm a director. Know my title. Know who I am. This is important to me. That's what I'm tempted to say when someone would say such a thing. But instead, by the grace of God, I responded, the ministry is going so well. God is so good, so good to his church. And I try to point back to what God is doing and my opportunity to serve. We can't get tied up with our titles. We can't try to force ourselves to a higher position. And I think that's a warning for us, not to love our titles, but to love the one who has the ultimate titles, Jesus himself. Verses 8 through 12 then kind of recap these warnings, these three warnings to the disciples. So 8 through 12 says this, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, For you have one Father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Here Jesus is painting, you have your negative examples of your Pharisees, your scribes and Pharisees. Now you have your positive example, and that's Jesus, your true instructor, the one you can trust in. Now, If you're a teacher here in this morning, you might need to change your title. If you are a father, you maybe should tell your kids to quit calling you father because it seems like Jesus is speaking that here. If you're an instructor, 
you might need to find a new title as well. But that's not what Jesus is doing. He's not saying that we can't use these little titles in our day-to-day lives. He's talking about the position that these titles represent. Don't say that you have a teacher on earth who, can, who is above Jesus and his teachings. Don't say you have a father on earth who can teach you something counter to your father in heaven, who has authority above your father in heaven. Don't look to the instruction of the Pharisees. Look to the instruction of the prophet standing in front of you, Jesus. That's what he's pointing to. He's pointing to servanthood, following him and his example, as he is the positive example and the Pharisees are the negative ones. Jesus is on the scene and he's showing them what it really looks like to follow a leader, no longer these Pharisees. I love this. We can humble ourselves, and it's a passive sense. Then the humbled will be exalted. Passive. It's not as though we can humble ourselves and someday we'll be able then to exalt ourselves. Our humility and our exaltation are two different actions. One is our action. The other one is God's. God is the one who exalts us, and He gets the honor and glory for that. So this first section, we see Jesus calling his disciples to be servants, those who are humble servants. This next section, we'll see how he contrasts what he's calling his disciples to be with the Pharisees, for they are like serpents. We see a clear contrast from servant to serpent. We see a pronouncement to the hypocrite in these next seven woes and they are weighty. A woe is a passionate, alas, it's a passionate declaration, a pronouncement of judgment. And in this context, it is a judicial pronouncement. And he's speaking to not leaders, but misleaders. He's spoken about this word hypocrites before, a couple years prior in Matthew 6, when he was speaking about blowing a trumpet when you give to someone who's in need, or praying in public so you'll be seen by others. So this theme of hypocrisy is often tied to these Pharisees. But we hear it all the way back in Isaiah 29, where where God says, people speak of me on their lips and in their mouth, but their hearts are far from me. And this is where these seven woes are going to scribes and Pharisees who say things with their lips, who appear one way, but their hearts are far from them. Woe number one, verse 13. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You shut out the kingdom of heaven in the people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. These Pharisees are hypocrites because they claim to have the truth, They claim to know the Word of God, but refuse it and refuse to enter it themselves. They don't just not enter themselves, they actually hinder others from entering. And as the disciples are listening here, there is a lesson for them in each one of these woes. In this one, it would be telling His disciples to get out of the way. Be a pointer to me, He's saying. Be a pointer to Jesus, not to yourselves. Don't get in the way of people getting under the authority of Jesus when you try to get them under your authority, as the Pharisees were trying to do. But be a pointer to the kingdom. Don't put obstacles in the way of people searching to know the Lord. Point them to Jesus. The next woe is highly tied to that. It says this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And I underline that hypocrite word. You'll see it so many times in this passage. For you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he comes, becomes a proselyte, you make him a twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. This is a good thing to travel far. I believe it would be very successful if you would travel far and get a convert. That is amazing. I think of our land over here. We bought this harvest Uh, campus over here, and the owner of it came to know the Lord and was baptized. That's amazing. That's worth buying the land, in my opinion. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about the result of their work. Look at the result. The result is that they 
put on these new converts burdens. It's as though they're not winning these converts to Judaism, they're winning them to Phariseeism. They're winning them to themselves and not to Jesus. They go far to just win someone for themselves. Question for the disciples, a question for us. Is this hard for us? Is our motives when we're seeking to help someone know the Lord, is it more about us or more about having them look more like us as a certain Christian in a certain context? Are we more concerned with changing them to look like us and maybe their words and their clothes versus what's happening inside of them? Do we want to win them to usher in the service? Do we want to win them to quit lying on their taxes? Rules that are good but never save. These Pharisees didn't have room for Jesus in their religion. Their evangelism, if you put it that way, didn't have room for Jesus. Our evangelism needs to be about Jesus. We win people to Jesus, not to ourselves. We want to free them up for renewal in their lives, not to some cultural form or engagement. This is the warning for the Pharisees and a lesson for the disciples. May our evangelism be all about who Jesus is and not about us. The, second two, the next two woes, woes three and four, are connected through a legal, a, a legal connection here. It says this, Woe to you blind guides! You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools! For which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift of, that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or that the alt- altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. This woe is Jesus charging the teachers here, the the scribes and Pharisees, of not telling the truth. They focus more on loopholes in their burdens, and their integrity is basically gone. They value gold more than God's temple. They value sacrifices more than God's altar. They value heaven more than the God who dwells there. And the reason why gold, an altar, or heaven is a sacred place is because it's direct connection to the presence of God. These scribes and Pharisees are abusing their oaths. They are using cultural norms to put burdens on people so that they don't have to keep their word. They can find the loophole for their own burdens. One question that comes to mind, probably by the disciples are thinking, wait a minute, Jesus, again, a few years ago, you said on the Sermon on the Mount, take no oaths of any kind. And now you're saying we can take certain oaths if we do it right? Jesus said in Matthew 5, you should take no oaths of any, of, of any kind, either by heaven or by the throne of God. He said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Simply have your yes or no. The theme here in this woe is abusing oaths. And I believe Jesus in Matthew 5 isn't doing a full prohibition against all oaths. He's doing the prohibition against, against um, abusing our oaths. There's cultural contexts where we would use an oath. And the Pharisees are abusing that context. They are not doing what last chapter talked about. Chapter 22, greatest commandment. Love God and love your neighbor. They're not using their oaths to love their neighbor. We might use an oath in our culture today. That oath might say something like, I call God to witness that I'm going to tell the truth. That'd be something we would do in the court of law. That'd be loving our neighbor because we are telling them that what we're saying is trustworthy. The Pharisees weren't about trying to say something that's trustworthy. They just wanted to 
abuse the system, to put loopholes and burdens on others and weren't willing to help them with those. So the application, integrity. Do what you say you're going to do. Don't try to trick your way out of commitment or convince yourself that you're not liable to your commitments, especially in our low-commitment culture, our non-committal culture. Seek accountability in this area. This is a temptation that Jesus shares, I believe, condemnation towards the Pharisees, but a temptation that his disciples are going to face and that we face. Temptation of not staying to our word. The next woe talks more about these legal matters and how they're working out. Woe in chapter, or sorry, verse 23. It's the fourth woe. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. There's your word again. Hypocrites. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining gnat and swallowing a camel. Jesus is talking about two good things here, giving, tithing things. That's good. He's also talking about other good things, mercy, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. But what he's saying is justice, mercy, and faithfulness is more important than tithing. There's a priority here. There's a pattern of the Pharisees to major on the minors instead of minoring on the minors and majoring on the majors. They are neglecting justice, mercy, and and faithfulness. When I would teach our membership class, and we get to a, a point of what the members are called to do, we get to this, this section about being faithful stewards with our finances. And the question has come up, is there a standard for members of how much, or is there a standard for members for our giving to the church? You know, is there a percentage or a certain amount? And I said, yes, there's, a high, there's actually a really high standard for our giving financially here. It's a standard of faithfulness. That is much harder than a standard of a certain amount of money. It's easier to give a certain percentage of your income than to do it faithfully. We do not want to neglect our faithfulness in, in these areas and simply go through the actions. These little gnats that they would filter through were unclean. They weren't supposed to eat them. So they would filter through these little tiny gnats and they would be able to eat to, uh, be eat food that's clean, but a camel is unclean as well. And Jesus is saying, you're eating a whole camel. You're straining a little diddly gnat, and you're eating a camel. This reminds me of what the Free Church is trying to create. The Evangelical Free Church of America, we're first free church on this side of the cities of Maplewood right now. And what we want to do in the Free Church is major on the major, majors and minor on the minors. We want to focus on the things that are central to the gospel. We want to focus on the triune nature of God and, and that Jesus is fully God and fully man and the sufficiency and inerrancy of Scripture. These are things we, we want to focus on. We want to focus on justice and mercy, not little details, little, little meddling, the color of our bathroom or what we wear on a Sunday morning. May we not be charged with this woe that these Pharisees are charged with. And may we major on the majors is what we've tried to do. Woe well, number five in verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate that the outside may be clean. These scribes and Pharisees clean the outside of their dinnerware and neglect the inside. They love the Word of God. They love the Torah. They love the law, but they neglect to love it. They might put it on their forehead. They might put it on their doorposts, but they don't love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. They are proclaiming commitment, but are not willing to commit to the Lord. Jesus gives a correction to them. Clean the inside first, he says, with a result. Clean the inside, and guess what? That will result in the outside 
being clean. You cannot clean the outside and expect the inside to get clean. You cannot scrub hard enough on the outside to clean the inside of this dinnerware. Well, how do we clean the inside of this dinnerware? How do we clean this cup and plate? Is it elbow grease with a Joy dish soap or a Dawn dish soap or a finish in our dishwasher tablets? Do we focus on those things? What we're supposed to focus on is joy in the Lord, that we trust that what He's done, that when He said it's finished, that it's finished, and that on the third day, when the dawn rose, that He had victory that we can trust in. Jesus wants the inside of our cup clean by trusting in Him to be the cleaner. He has great stuff, stronger stuff. And it's tempting to just clean the outside, isn't it? Our goal should be to clean the inside first. And then, by result, the outside will be cleaned. Confessing our sins, washing ourselves in the blood of Jesus. Woe number six, verse 27, says this. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, which within are full of dead people's bones, all uncleanliness. So you outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. This last April, I was able to see one of the seven modern wonders of the world. It was beautiful. It blew my mind. It was made out of marble, this huge dome with four pillars around it. You could see it for miles. It was a very dirty city that we were in, and this marble white building was just gorgeous. It beamed with light. I assume that's how the temple would have looked, just this white and gold. This didn't have a lot of gold, but all this marble. It was the Taj Mahal. It's just absolutely beautiful. Probably one of the most beautiful buildings I've ever seen. It was just breathtaking. We, we would, you know, walk up to it, and it takes so long because there's all these guardians going up to it, and it's just majestic. You know what the purpose, you know why that king, that emperor built the Taj Mahal? It's a tomb. It's for his wife, her bones. Not for her to live in, not for any king to enjoy, to have life inside, but simply to put a corpse, to put a skeleton that has no life. And this is what the Pharisees would rather look like. They'd rather look great on the outside, this beautiful Taj Mahal, but on the inside have no life to it at all. They would rather have that. Outside piety, but no life on the inside. This is a warning, warning to those that look good on the outside. During this time, when Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees, they would actually wash tombs, whitewash tombs, to kind of warn people that this is a place of uncleanliness, and also to dress it up a little bit as people would come into town for the Passover. They would whitewash these tombs so people would know not to go near them because they were a little bit easier to see because if you touched a tomb, you would be unclean. So Jesus is saying, you're, you're trying to look beautiful on the outside, and what you're doing is you're becoming those whitewashed tombs. And your teaching, if someone follows, is you're causing them to become unclean like you would if you touched a tomb during the Passover. If you touch a tomb during the Passover, you couldn't partake. You travel all that way and you couldn't partake. The teaching of the Pharisees is unclean because of their inward self. If anyone comes near them, Jesus is basically saying, woe to them. They want to look good on the outside. May we seek to understand our identity in the Lord and know what it means that we are in Christ from the inside out. Woe number seven, verse 29. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding blood of the prophets. This context is about prophets that were sent to Israel that were rejected. Prophets would come, and the Pharisees were saying, we wouldn't reject them. We wouldn't cause their blood to flow. And yet there's a prophet standing right in front of them. 
the greatest prophet, better than Moses, and they're rejecting him, and they are going to make his blood flow. This is the climactic woe. You have rejected the prophets. You have rejecting Jesus here. You're not trusting in him. And for us today to think about, Don Carson says, they, the scribes and Pharisees, believe that they would not have joined the four fathers in murdering the prophets, just as many Christians today, so us, naively think that they would not have responded, they would have responded better to Jesus when the disciples or the crowds cried, crucify him. We are so tempted to look back on the story of Jesus and go, we wouldn't have been that bad as the disciples, as the crowds. We wouldn't have yelled, crucify him. In a sense, just like the Pharisees are in denial, they are in need of grace. It's a position of humility that we need to be in as Christians. Ones that we say, we would have said crucify him. We would have, I would have done a hundred times more mistakes than the disciples. I need Christ more than anyone else I know. This isn't about reading back into stories and being a Pharisee about it. We need to love our humility, the place at the feet of the cross. The greatest hypocrisy that we could have today, so we heard a lot of hypocrisy about these Pharisees, is that we say we walk in light, we with, we're with God, yet we walk in darkness. That's the greatest hypocrisy we can live today. 1 John 1, 5 through 9, talks about that we, if we don't practice the light, we lie. If we say we have not sinned, this is verse 8, if we say we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So if we go around as though we have not sinned, as though we don't need a Savior, as though we don't need this cross, we put words out that we are, we are doing better than we are, we put an appearance on that we don't need a Savior because we're doing well, we are looking, and all we're doing is deceiving ourselves. The Lord knew we would sin. The Lord knows we'll make mess up. When he was on the cross, he knew every sin that you would have committed up till this morning, even right now, on your drive home. He knows every sin until he takes you home. He knew them. Don't think you have to hide them. Confess them to the Lord. Verse 9 gives us a little hope of 1 John 1. We can, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise God that his blood would flow. And if we trust in that, these woes aren't for us this morning. These woes are not for us. Let us not minimize our sin. Woe to us calling our Lord a liar. Verse 10, 1 John 1 verse 10 says this, If we say we have not sinned, if we act, if we say as though we have not sinned, we make him to be a liar and his word is not in us. We stand at the feet of the cross with blood surrounding our feet from our Savior and we say, you phony, I don't need that. We're going to close with a song, so I'll welcome the band up. And this song is going to help us respond to this precious reality this eternal reality that our approval is with the Lord if we trust in Him. It's not with man. That we make Christ to be true. We don't make Him to be a liar. We do that by trusting in Him. If that's the first time that you trust in Christ, do that. If you have trusted in Him, continue to know that you need to confess your sin and that we are all sinners. So this song will help us think through how we are washed, that our guilt is gone. We are not in this camp of the Pharisees if we trust in Christ as our one teacher, trust in the Father, and our one instructor, Christ. Let's sing. <laughs>